Welcome everybody. So we are starting the, the this semester seminar series, but by a lecture on uh, atmosphere on predictability in turbulence uh, with uh, relevance. We are hoping to discuss it for the atmosphere and ocean. And the speaker and the TRR guest this week is uh, Nazmir Burak Bugano from the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden. So, welcome, Burak, to Hamburg. You see, we fixed weather for you. <laughs> so, we hope you will enjoy and we are looking forward to your talk. Great. Thank you very much for this very nice invitation. It's my first time in Hamburg and I must say it's Beautiful. And thank you, a special thank you for all of you who are being in person. It's nice to speak to real people, you know, rather than a laptop screen only. Okay, so um, title is Scale Dependent Error Growth in Navier-Stokes uh, Simulations. And I will talk about this one paper which just last month appeared on PRE. Okay. And all right, let me begin with a very, you know, uh, baby step introduction, if I can change the slide. Okay, good. So um, I'll, I just want to introduce very uh, briefly the idea of sensitive dependence in initial con on initial conditions that is essentially the defining property of a chaotic system. Okay, and I'll do that using this Roslar system that is a three-dimensional chaotic system uh, described by these three ordinary differential equations and uh, with certain a b parameters a b c if you just start a random initial condition and integrate using your favorite numerical integrator you get this attractor it's called Rosler attractor okay and um what is sensitive dependence on initial condition is the following if i uh, have two trajectories if i add a perturbation to this uh, initial condition that's on this attractor. So uh, I add a perturbation that is like 10 to minus two times X, so a tiny perturbation to my initial condition. And I run integrate two uh, initial conditions forward in time with my numerical integrator. So these are these blue and dashed orange trajectories in this time series. After some time, um, um, these two, uh, sort of trajectories two time series become essentially indistinguishable from simply selecting two random points on this attractor, right? So because uh, even though they are initially very close, uh, after uh, their differences, the initial difference gets amplified by an uh, exponential growth. And then uh, eventually the predictions are practically useless. So this is, exponential error growth, but what this also uh, implies is that if the initial error is lower, if we have smaller initial error to begin with, uh, two trajectories follow one another for a longer time, okay? So this is much smaller initial error, 10 to minus four, but uh, even though they are amplified exponentially, we keep the approximation for a longer time horizon. So this tells, this is usually known as the butterfly effect. Yeah? So in the popular culture. And then, uh, but even though there's exponential error growth, still, if we make the initial error smaller, we get longer predictions, longer prediction horizon. All right, so to my embarrassment, uh, last year I learned that this is not what Laurent meant by the butterfly effect. Okay, uh, so I didn't know, but actually it turns out Laurent said a uh, much different idea when he was talking about, you know, butterfly wings in Brazil and tornadoes in uh, Texas. Okay, All right. so uh, what Laurent was saying, which uh, recently, Tim Palmer began to call it as the real butterfly effect. Okay, but Lomrens was saying something different. So this is a um, direct quote from this uh, 1969 paper, and uh, it reads: If small errors generally require about five days to double, uh, should be possible to increase the range of predictability by five days by uh, simply by reducing the initial field of errors to half its size. Okay, uh, and then after that, simply 
there's a parenthesis. This might be very hard. Of course, this is an <laughs> instrumentation wise, this is a very hard thing to do. But in actuality, for reasons to follow, such a reduction may well increase the range of predictability by much a smaller amount. So um, um, this now I don't say the uh, reason here, but Lorenz suggests that even though you can make your initial conditions more precise in an atmospheric uh, prediction or a hydrodynamic prediction scenario, this may not translate to longer prediction horizon. So I like to explain what this is about in a toy problem and the toy problem uh, for the toy problem, I'm going back to the uh, Roslayer system. So again, I have my three ODEs and I'm introducing this shorthand C that equals to F of C as, uh, you know, imagine C is the three-dimensional vector and the, uh, you know, time derivative equals to a nonlinear function. Okay. And I'll introduce a scaling to the Roslayer system such that uh, so I'll scale my state vector and then right-hand side with these uh, scales such that my attractor is in the unit cube, okay? So um, from X, uh, in X direction, it goes from zero to one, in Y direction, it goes from zero to one, in Z direction, from zero to one. So attractor is in this, uh, confined to this unit cube by choosing some appropriate scales, okay? Uh, now I have what I call the normalized Roslar system. So next step is introducing a scaling to this normalized Roslar system. And it's going to be like this. Uh, I'll have a scale L. So scale L will uh, scale my state vectors by L to the one third. And then I will also scale time with this uh, scale L. And then that, that's going to go like two thirds. Uh, time will be L to the two thirds of time. And so if I look at my scaled Rosler attractors now, um, the original one, L equals one is confined to from zero to one to zero to one. And then uh, L equals 0.5 is smaller attractor and smaller attractor and so on. And if I look at the time series of these uh, trajectories, um, as you can see by construction, right? I uh, constructed the system this way. When I look at the small scale system, I have faster oscillations, okay? And the last ingredient in the toy model is coupling these systems together, okay? What if I have this uh, Roslar systems at different scales uh, that are coupled to one another, so they influence one another but through some diffusive coupling term, and the coupling is very weak. So in this system, if I look at the error behavior, what I find is that uh, depending on however many uh, Roslar systems I couple together this way, uh, the smaller scalar systems I add, I find faster error growth. So I run a numerical experiment and numerical experiment is this. I truncate my system at different K, okay? If I have four coupled to a system, I have relatively slow error growth. And then if I have um, seven Roslar systems to together, I get to the um, sort of error plateau even faster. So here the vertical axis is uh, logarithmic. It's the error growing and the horizontal axis is time. So when I introduce a small scale system, I get faster error growth. And why? Because the small scale system has faster time scales to it. So this is by construction. Now, um, the question is, are hydrodynamic systems like this? Do hydrodynamics have this built in? And uh, to go in that direction, let me first introduce you uh, what kind of systems that I'm going to be talking about. I will uh, consider the Navier-Stokes equations. So Navier-Stokes equations are these partial differential equations for a velocity field in three dimensions, OK? And then, so left-hand side is the time derivative and then the advection term here. And the right-hand side, we have forces and the uh, pressure gradient that is eliminated by the uh, um, incompressibility condition. That's the uh, yeah, divergence-free condition. And we have diffusion here. And usually there will be some sort of forcing, okay? The forcing will in, uh, in input energy into the system and it will be uh, dissipated by diffusion. 
Okay. So um, on the left hand side here, uh, the resolution is not perfect, but this is one of the uh, you know highest resolution simulations of a turbulent flow. Um, let me see if I can move this indicator so you can see. Just, um, maybe top is the best place to have it. Okay, so now the rest of the slide is visible. Good. Um, so this is a snapshot from a highly turbulent flow simulation that's very high Reynolds number, so it should be on the order of millions, probably, and um, in the outer units, okay? Uh, but uh, so they're using 4,096 cube domain, and uh, so 4,096 grid points in all directions, and then uh, simulate what's called a homogeneous isotropic turbulent flow. So there is a forcing in the system that is isotropic in all direction, and they look at the vorticity isosurfaces. And you can see there are structures in different scales, you know, if you squint, but a um, better way to look at uh, how uh, structures are uh, distributed across scales is these plots, which are called spectra. So uh, this is an energy spectrum plot where uh, the horizontal axis is uh, k times eta, k is the wave number, okay? And so wave number has a, a inverse length unit and it's non-dimensionalized by so-called Kolmogorov length scale. And I will define this later, but Kolmogorov length scale is the length scale is known as at which the dissipation is important, okay? So, and then you plot uh, the energy contained in uh, a wavelength uh, in the vertical axis. So this is the energy stored in the wave number K. And here there are actually more than uh, one simulation. There are five different Reynolds numbers, I believe. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, as you can see, when they are uh, scaled by the Kolmogorov unit, these five wavelengths are, uh, sorry, five different Reynolds numbers uh, have these different tails at the low wave numbers, but they are universal in the small scales. And this is important. In the small scales, turbulence have universality, okay? Now, what Lorenz suggests in this 1969 paper is the subfollowing. Uh, when you have this phenomenology, when you have uh, many scales together in a, a fluid uh, system, okay? And if you imagine a practical scenario where you have a finer grid, finer measurement grid, and um, so uh, lower initial error in your initial state of the system, what you have to do is introduce small scales into the system. And if you introduce small scale motions into the system, necessarily you are introducing faster time scales and those faster time scales might give you faster growing errors, like the one in the toy model that I showed. All right, so apparently this was what the butterfly effect was all about. So uh, progressively worse uh, predictions is you increase the resolution in the hydrodynamic model. And the question that we ask here is uh, essentially this particular, um, question, does inclusion of small scale, smaller spatial scales into hydrodynamic models result in faster error growth, okay? Do we have, if we take a system, a particular system, and then model it with, uh, with models with increasing uh, resolution, do we get faster error growth? And we're going to do this uh, in a essentially a toy problem for all the models that you consider that I just learned, okay? So the toy problem is gonna be large eddy simulation. And large eddy simulation is the type of simulation where you cut off the resolution at a certain grid length, and then you model the uh, motions below that uh, length scale through some modeling, okay? And the uh, equations, the Navier-Stokes equations that I'm going to consider are this one, now written in the index notation, and uh, two terms are non-standard. Uh, one of them is this steady viscosity, it appears here, 
Okay, so the rest of the, believe me, this the rest of this uh, Reynolds to the minus one and SIG, I will define it soon. They are just the uh, usual Laplacian. Okay, and I have a forcing on the right hand side, and forcing is necessary because without the forcing, Navier Stokes is dissipative, everything will die out. So this forcing will uh, inject energy into the system, and it's just a sine wave, as you can see. And uh, this energy will give us uh, turbulence. Okay, and uh, now the uh, definition of the things uh, that are above. Um, SIG is the uh, this gradient tensor um, here, uh, rate of strain tensor, I'm sorry. And then uh, nu T is the eddy viscosity. This is the uh, term that is, uh, not exactly correct, but definitely necessary because without the viscosity, we don't uh, uh, dissipate enough energy. So we need some way of uh, extracting energy from the system. And it's defined like this. Uh, so there is a uh, summation over the repeated indices and CS is known as the Smagorinsky constant. And that's a phenomenological constant it's set to 0 0.1 in all simulations. And delta is the grid spacing. Okay. And finally, we have periodic boundary conditions. So in each direction, uh, my domain is a cube, periodic cube. Okay. And then the, uh, each direction is the cube has the same um, yeah, edge length four. And we have the incompressibility condition written like this. So that's the divergence free condition. So here are snapshots from uh, three simulations. They are all at the same Reynolds number. So Reynolds number is the uh, control parameter that you know, determines how turbulent we are, let's say. And then um, I have different resolutions. So these are all larger dissimulation snapshots at different resolutions. So, the resolution goes from 32 to 96 in all three directions. And then uh, I'm looking at what's called the Q criterion, some isosurfaces that tells me where are vortices. Okay, so, um, but the point of these pictures is to tell you that in, if I um, visualize this Q criterion, I see more and more small scale motions when I uh, increase the resolution. However, if I look at the velocity profile, that is the average mean flow in the X direction, they are essentially roughly the same. So these are not ensemble averages, these are sing single snapshot. And if I look at the mean flow, um, they, they seem to capture the large scale as well, but uh, in the small scales, we have very different systems. Finally, uh, on this slide, this is open source. You can just download and use this code if you want. Uh, it's in, can be found in this address. Good. Now, this slide is to just to reiterate what I just said. Basically, uh, if I compare large the simulation to the fully resolved simulation, fully resolved means I don't have this Magorinsky model anymore. I have a grid that goes all the way down to the Kolmogorov scale. What happens, and then look at the spectrum uh, spectra of uh, different resolutions and DNS. Uh, you see that the DNS here is this dash blue curve. Okay, so it goes all the way to the Kolmogorov scales basically. And LES, as I increase the resolution of LES, I see uh, first of all at the large scales, essentially everything is the same. Large scales is the low wave numbers. Okay, but as I add more and more uh, grid points to the LES, LES goes towards DNS, which is a confirmation of, you know, we are doing the right thing because yeah, what you expect from LES is to be correct in the large scales and then uh, over damp to small scales. And that's what it does. Okay. Now, this is the setup. The next thing we do is to actually look at the growth rate of errors. And to do that, we estimate the Lyapunov exponents and the Lyapunov exponents is the um, rate of exponential error growth. So I had this definition in the earlier slides, but I hope it's familiar to you. But okay, what do we do is very standard. Um, we start, we simulate the trajectory. So U is my entire velocity field now, and I have a numerical integrator that takes U and uh, marches forward in time with some standard uh, 
numerical integration method. Okay, and so let this blue trajectory be my um, you know stand original trajectory. What I do is I add a small perturbation to that trajectory. That's the this delta u, and then I evolve them in parallel. And after some time, because after some time it's going to be too far away because of the exponential error growth. So I have to rescale it and get it uh, closer to the trajectory and iterate this process. And when I do this for a long time, uh, I can use this uh, formula to just sum how much the errors are um, multiplied and then take an average. And that will be my um, mean exponential growth rate. And an actual calculation looks like this on the, um, here I'm just showing you uh, what I get by doing this at all those different resolutions at a single Reynolds number that was 20,000, I believe. As you can see, after some long, long, long integration time, I see a converged average for uh, each individual resolution. So N is the number of grid points. All right. So that brings me to my results. Results are, uh, so in this uh, project, we looked at uh, five different Reynolds numbers. Okay, so the Reynolds number um, is, uh, yeah, this one here. Okay, but there are different ways of defining Reynolds numbers in, in terms of different scales of the flow. These next following two uh, columns are those. So this is the Reynolds number in terms of the RMS velocity fluctuations. So that's easier to compare to different systems. And this is what's called the Taylor Reynolds number. And if you're familiar with turbulence literature, these Taylor Reynolds numbers are relatively small. Okay, so uh, the snapshot that I showed you earlier, that's a Taylor Reynolds number, maybe close to a thousand. So we are uh, only going up to around 54. Okay, and then for each of those Reynolds numbers, we uh, run LES in different resolutions. So we have uh, plenty of different LES simulations. And here are, you can see the DNS resolutions. And the last column is the largest uh, wave number that we resolve time the Kolmogorov scale. And um, yeah, if you're not familiar with this literature, of course, it doesn't mean much, but all I want to say is that these are really, really, really highly resolved simulations, and that's important, okay? And I will come to this later. Okay, but the first set of results are here. Uh, on this plot, the horizontal axis is uh, one over resolution now. So one over delta is one over grid spacing. I'm sorry, the, yeah, one over grid spacing. So uh, resolution is the horizontal axis. So when I go from left to right, I have more uh, resolution increases. I have more and more scales in the simulation. And the vertical axis is the uh, Lyapunov exponent. So first thing we see is that um, as I increase the resolution, I get faster uh, error growth indeed. So that's the case. Adding smaller scales into this model gives me a larger Lyapunov exponents. And that is what, that's what, you know, Lorenz was, worried about, okay? And then, um, but there's something kind of strange. It looks like the Lyapunov exponent at uh, Reynolds 10,000 is larger than the Lyapunov exponent Reynolds 8,000 because the 10,000 is on the very top. And that's uh, just a problem with how I non-dimensionalize my model, okay? Because uh, here you can see that on the forcing term, I also scale by the Reynolds number. So, um, this sets the time uh, scale convenient for numerics, but it's actually not a physical time scale. If I go back to physical time scale, uh, everything collapses, and that is the um, and that is the uh, time scale that one gets from the Kolmogorov uh, scaling. So, in in this plot, I'm showing the same data. But uh, now the times are uh, scaled by the Kolmogorov time and the uh, resolution is also scaled by the Kolmogorov scale. And what are those is easier to discuss on the dimensional Navier-Stokes equations. So now I just rewrote the Navier-Stokes equation, but uh, here I have kinematic viscosity in terms of the 
in instead of the inverse Reynolds number. And yeah, the forcing also has an appropriate unit. Okay. Now, kinematic viscosity has the uh, dimension length squared per time. And then uh, the dissipation rate of turbulence, if you work out the uh, uh, at what rate the fluctuations dissipate, you get this expression. You know, so this we calculate from in numerics. So we, we get a number for epsilon, the dissipation rate, and that dissipation rate is length square per time cube. So using these two quantities, basically viscosity, kinematic viscosity and the rate of dissipation per unit mass, we can get two uh, length scale, uh, two scales. One is a length scale that's called the Kolmogorov length, and the other one is the time scale, that's the Kolmogorov time. So these are the uh, yeah, length and time scales we get from the dissipation. And what we see is that if we take our uh, Lyapunov exponents and the resolutions and then norm, uh, non-dimensionalize them at different Reynolds numbers, we see things that are, can be approximated by a single curve, okay? So the data of the previous slide collapses onto one uh, curve. So why could that be? Well, that is what I said earlier is a property of um, uh, turbulence. The small scale universality is one of the uh, sort of basic hypotheses of the Kolmogorov's 1941 theory. And this, um, um, this property of turbulence was uh, until recently, thought of as a property that only shows up when the turbulence is at very high Reynolds number. But then recent work, uh, Schumacher et al. Uh, of PNAS uh, argues very nicely that actually small scale universality doesn't require an inertial range. For small scale universality, so long as the um, simulations have sufficient re resolution, one observes universal statistics in the small scales. And um, our analysis is not as detailed as theirs, but we are we basically replot all the data we get for the uh, fluid states and also the Apuno vectors, et cetera. And we do see this data collapse in the small scale. So this is the first example of that. So um, on these plots, I'm showing the uh, energy spectra uh, similar to the ones that I showed. These are DNS. And then when I uh, non-dimensionalize these spectra using Kolmogorov units, I see they all uh, at the small scales, they are all uh, on the same curve basically. And I do the same thing for the Lyapunov vectors. And this is very important because this is where uh, I think this is where uh, what our observations are following from. So these are the spectra of the Lyapunov vectors. Now I'm not looking at the spectra of the flute uh, states, but I'm looking at the spectra of the motions that uh, amplify most, okay? So in my Lyapunov exponent uh, computation, uh, what one eventually expects is that uh, your, uh, these perturbations will align with the direction that uh, amplify the most, okay? So that's the leading Lyapunov vector. And if you look at the spectra of those perturbations, you see that at these intermediate scales, uh, they accumulate. And most importantly, they also, their spectra also collapse if you scale them using uh, Kolmogorov units. So the small scale universality seems to be applying to leading Lyapunov vectors as well. Okay. And then what happens in LES, but LES, you have to be a bit more careful because in LES, in each case is different because each case have different resolutions. But uh, uh, if you pick the domains such that their resolutions match in Kolmogorov units, then the uh, spectra of the Lyapunov vectors also align with one another. So I have three examples here. Uh, for instance, let's look carefully uh, at one of them. This blue and uh, that dotted orange are um, no. Um, so blue and red are 20, Reynolds 20 and 40,000. Oh, these numbers are not very easy to read here, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Do you see them? Um, so here, Reynolds 20,000, 40,000. So different Reynolds numbers and uh, resolutions 24 and 32. 
uh, when I rescale them in Kolmogorov units, they appear uh, on top of one another, okay? And that's expected because the Kolmogorov length of 20 and 40,000 uh, matches the uh, ratio of the resolutions, okay? So all these ratios are approximately 1.3. So uh, spectra of the Elias Lyapunov vectors overlap in domains with resolutions that match in Kolmogorov units. So uh, we see the universal properties also in Elias uh, Lyapunov vectors. Okay, now um, what can we do with this result? Well, uh, we uh, found a data collapse so we can fit it with something and that uh, function in this case, uh, appropriate function appears to be a power law. So I'm showing the same data on left and right hand sides. And then right hand side, we have a log log plot here. And uh, the dashed line is a fit. And that fit is in the form of a power law uh, is a function of the um, grid spacing. So alpha times delta to the minus rho. And um, if we look at the limit where the resolution uh, goes to infinity, which is grid spacing goes to zero, this uh, lambda goes to infinity. And of course, that's an unphysical limit. Why? Because if we keep increasing the resolution, we reach DNS. We don't go to uh, infinite resolution. We have a, a sort of saturation point. But nevertheless, uh, it's sort of instructive to think about this limit. and. We now uh, consider uh, finally a prediction horizon scenario based on these observations. And uh, we start that from uh, going back to the exponential error growth. So this is the standard formula for the exponential error growth, uh, initial error times exponential of lambda t. Now, we, uh, in a practical scenario, uh, one usually has a threshold error. So when uh, and, and magnitude of error to say, after this point, all predictions are useless because this is uh, not very informative. So that's the epsilon th. If I put epsilon th and for, to, solve for time, I get this expression. So just uh, instead of et, we put epsilon threshold take logarithm of both sides, solve for time. So this is what I'm going to define as the prediction horizon. Now, I take this formula and uh, instead of uh, uh, the Apunov exponent and the initial error, I'll place, uh, put something that I found. First thing, um, I imagine a scenario now, this is a sort of a hypothetical forecast scenario. I imagine I have a measurement grid and uh, my initial errors are proportional to the grid spacing by some proportionality constant, okay? And then, uh, and that grid spacing is the grid spacing of my LES. So that's the same uh, resolution of my model. And um, I plug in those ands that say into the prediction horizon equation and now get an uh, expression for prediction horizon in terms of the grid spacing, that's delta. Now, next slide, I plot this function and uh, so if, uh, prediction horizon is a function of grid spacing. And as you can see, say, and this is an arbitrary unit just to illustrate what this function looks like. When I increase the resolution and that's in this case going from right to left, so uh, reducing the grid spacing, at one point, we don't stop. We stop gaining uh, time in the prediction horizon. Why? Because okay, we are approaching to the unphysical limit, but um, eventually the uh, Lyapunov exponent becomes infinity. Okay, in this uh, idealized scenario, um, so there are cases in this phenomenology where a finer measurement grid and lower initial error does not translate to a longer prediction horizon. And the limit is uh, given by the derivative of this curve. So when the derivative is zero, then the, uh, yeah, so you take a derivative, I'm sorry, there's a D missing here. If, take a der if you take a derivative with respect to resolution, then you get the uh, maximum prediction horizon in this uh, sort of scenario. Okay, so summary, 
um, of what I said, and I'm pretty good with time. Uh, I have a few more slides to discussion, but uh, let me just recap uh, the results so far. So I presented you simulations of sinusoidal force and the Stokes equations, and I showed you that the leading the of exponents uh, scale with Kolmogorov units. Okay, so it's this curve here. And I reasoned that this has to do with the small scale universality of turbulence fluctuations. Okay. Now, um, and this applied to LES as well when I uh, rescaled all my data using Kolmogorov units. So LES seems to follow this uh, property as well. And especially if the LES uh, resolutions match one another in Kolmogorov units, then the error behavior also seem to match one another in Kolmogorov units in these numerical experiments. Okay. And altogether, if we consider the exponential error growth in the system, this gives me one way of uh, strictly finite uh, prediction horizon. And that is if, the, uh, if everything we do is far from the Kolmogorov scale, so the um, initial measurements and hydrodynamic models are far from the uh, Kolmogorov scale, then uh, we might uh, not gain as much as we would uh, gain uh, in the exponential error gro growth case by simply making the measurement grid finer. Okay, so now um, I have a few discussion slides because uh, I want to mention a couple different results and different approaches from the literature. The, so the first issue is the scaling of the Lyapunov exponents. So um, the Scaling of the Yapunov exponents in terms of Kolmogorov units is actually uh, suggested uh, by David Ruel uh, in 95, and, but it's almost a heuristic suggestion, okay? And the reason is essentially uh, when we know the Kolmogorov theory and we know the smallest scales are uh, the dissipative scales in the flow, and if the uh, turbulence is universal, uh, that time scale should give us the error growth time scale uh, was the reasoning of Ruel, and that's supported by everything we observed, okay? But um, later in several papers about the same time, so 2017 PRL, PRF, and another PRL 2018, they, uh, these three papers found that this is not correct. In again, numerical simulations, they found that um, um, in Kolmogorov units, uh, Reynolds numbers keep increasing with increasing Reynolds. I'm sorry, in Kolmogorov units, the Lyapunov exponents keep increasing uh, as one increases the Reynolds number. So um, now I want to point out uh, a few things about these three papers. The first thing is. Each of these papers use this, uh, what's called, uh, um, yeah, I called it Machia forcing here. But um, so this forcing uh, term, so this is the F term on the right hand side of the Navier Stokes equation. So it's an isotropic deterministic forcing term that is uh, constructed in the Fourier space by uh, using the velocity field itself. So, uh, now, again, if you're outside the field, this is, you should be asking, why would anyone do such a thing? Okay, the idea is we want to have isotropic turbulence, or they want to have isotropic turbulence, and isotropic turbulence is a very idealized case. So there are reasons to study isotropic turbulence because that's the sort of hypothesized turbulence in the Kolmogorov theory. And how do you uh, introduce that in numerical simulation? And this is one way, because if you use the velocity field itself as the forcing term, then you don't have a preferred direction. So you have isotropic forcing. However, if you're um, considering error growth, this is a strange forcing term because it's positive feedback. It's, if you're using the velocity field itself for forcing, then those large scales at which the uh, system is physically expected to be stable is going to be unstable because it's positive feedback on the right hand side. Okay, so that's one issue 
that is different in our case, we have just constant forcing. The price we pay is a loss of isotropy, okay? Um, the other issue is that not necessarily an issue, but their resolution is much lower than ours. And again, that is a traditional um, sort of quality standard in this line of literature because uh, it's mostly about Kolmogorov 41 theory. So most uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence literature looks actually this, um, what's called the inertial range, these intermediate scales in the flow that uh, show scale invariance. So this is the minus five thirds result. Because if one is interested in this part of the spectrum, then it's okay to have slightly under-resolved simulations, okay? If you look at this tail end of the spectrum, you'll see that all of a sudden, uh, the energy content has a little bit of increase at the very end. And why is that? Because the uh, system is under-resolved. Uh, as a result of under-resolution, there's uh, overpopulation of the smallest scales because this system has to dissipate energy, okay? I don't know if it if this has any effect on the uh, Lyapunov exponent calculations, but it might because the, in these simulations you have more motions at the smallest scales. Okay, I think this is something to pay attention to. So altogether, I think this problem is open. We didn't go uh, uh, sufficiently high Reynolds numbers because this wasn't what we started to. Uh, start the project for, but um, we found, you know, um, contradicting results to other people. Uh, but I think one has to look at this. In, and this is a fundamental question about turbulence. How how do the um, Lyapunov exponent scale with the uh, time scales of the flow? And um, I think there's still uh, room for uh, more work here. Okay. The, Still have five minutes, right? So for two, okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's been forty-four minutes. So we started at fifteen. Okay, okay. Um, one last thing I want to mention is you because you might have seen this uh, this different way of thinking about uh, scale-dependent error growth, especially in these kind of simulations. Uh, is this uh, concept of scale dependent the point of x ones, which is very similar to what I showed you, but there are a few um, again fundamental differences. So um, in this ninety six PRL, Aurel et al introduces as the Apunov exponent that looks very much like ours, right? So the Apunov exponent as a uh, as a function of uh, scale. In this case, the scale of the velocity field. Okay, but this uh, exponent is strictly for finite amplitude errors. So this is not the Lyapunov exponent that we were looking for. Ours is the standard Lyapunov exponent. So this is a new Lyapunov exponent, just happens to be, have the same functional form as our fit. Okay, and the, um, and they uh, in this paper they give some numerical uh, evidence using a shell model uh, that in this shell model, the error growth uh, can be thought of as this uh, using the understood using the scale dependent uh, Lyapunov exponent. And later comes more numerical evidence uh, by Bofeta and Musacchio, which was also cited in the previous page. But the basically idea is, um, yeah, uh, it is kind of covered by this indicator here, but, um, they look at the error growth at different scales of the velocity field, and they find that the rate of the error growth can be described by this power law. But the physical picture is always like this. The initial errors are confined to the small scales, and they have had some initial errors at the small scales, and they let these initial errors to uh, move forward. Now, in our case, what we found by looking at the Lyapunov vectors, which are the fastest growing errors. So whatever initial error you have, they will align with these vectors. And they're not confined to the small scales in our case. What we find is that 
uh, if we look at the spectra of the Lyapunov vectors, uh, we have uncertainties at almost all scales uh, and combination of them amplifies the fastest. So this is a different perspective and maybe uh, that in for most cases, the exponential error growth might be irrelevant. So that's, uh, again, I'm not uh, coming from the practical side of this problem, but uh, this is sort of an important difference perspective uh, between these papers and what I presented. So that's all I have for you today. And we have another talk on Thursday and that's completely different. So <laughs> the Reynolds number is two orders magnitude smaller. We will be topological data analyses and dynamical systems theory. And okay, there's some dynamical systems theory here, but the, the Thursday talk will be much more dynamical systems theory. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can stop the recording okay. and have discussion uh, outside the recording. So, okay. Thank you very much. This is very, actually very interesting. I, I, I am working on much larger scales. Uh -huh. I don't know what are those, uh, <laughs> those smallest, but I, it's really, uh, there are many things to discuss. So, uh -huh.